Now that 2021 is finally coming to a close, I can finally say in confidence what I've been thinking all year, which is that 2021 is definitely the year with the biggest number ever. But it was also a year where I found myself buying and playing new gaming releases more so than usual. And looking back at the year, I gotta say, a lot of interesting things hit the market this year. So I kind of wanted to talk about every new release that I played in 2021 in order of how much I liked it with an actual ranking system. A 7 is not an average game, I'm not IGN. Anything above a 5 means I thought the game was good. And I'm not giving these scores as a definitive statement of the game's quality, but rather how much I personally got out of playing it. And I'm judging releases as modern titles. I don't care if it's a PS2 game, the point of a re-release is to make it enjoyable for the modern audience. Any idea what that's a reference to? Also, in case it's not clear enough, this video is all about me, me, me. It's about the games I played, not the games you did, so I'm gonna be talking about these, and not these. Let's be clear, not the- not this one. I did not play Metroid Dread, I'm not talking about it. It could be the best game of the year, I haven't played it, so all about me, baby. And lastly, spoilers. Basically, I'm going to keep my thoughts vague enough that if you've played the games I'm talking about, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to. But if you haven't played them, you really won't get anything spoiled for you, and you'll still be able to make an informed decision on whether or not you should pick it up. But check out full-time reviewers if you have any doubts. That's not the intention of this video. It's more to just share my thoughts. So, of course, let's get started with... Oh boy... Yeah, so I'm currently working on a video sharing my thoughts partially on this game to coincide with next month's Pokemon release, but for now, let's focus on some basics. This game is a remaster of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, aka Pokemon's fourth generation of games. Now, the definitive edition of Gen 4, Pokemon Platinum, remains my favorite mainline Pokemon release to date. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl sought to continue the tradition of bringing now outdated Pokemon releases into the modern day. But while Gens 1, 2, and 3 all received generally similar and generally outstanding remasters, this one deviates. You see, until now, the remasters largely did one thing. Recreate the original generation in the modern engine. So, Gen 1's remake takes place in Gen 3's engine, Gen 2 and Gen 4's, and Gen 3 and Gen 6's. Additionally, the exclusive content in the third version of the original generation would be incorporated in some fashion while typically adding exclusive content. Instead of doing that though, the Gen 4 remakes are generally a one-to-one -one remake of the original Diamond and Pearl in an entirely new, entirely inferior engine. Not only that, but the game fails to even implement the improvements to balancing that Platinum introduced. While, yes, the underground and post-game were expanded, these remakes are in no way the definitive Gen 4 experience. Meaning, there are as many reasons to play Platinum over these new releases as there are to play the new releases over Platinum, as opposed to making sure Platinum would be rendered mostly redundant other than for nostalgia purposes, as was the case with most of the remakes prior. Especially considering its insane selling price these days. And while the art style is fine, usually, it, it did grow on me a bit, they really should have had the proportionate models used for cutscenes. Any close-up of a character in this game just looks absurd. Out of all the Pokemon titles on the Switch, this is easily my least favorite, especially given how good of a remake the Let's Go entries were. To put it plainly, this game is honestly a 4 out of 10 for me. It's starting out at a 5 out of 10 because it does succeed at being a 1 to 1 remake, which would make it average, but in my opinion, the cons of the remake's execution just outweigh the pros. They're certainly fun to be had, especially if you've never played the originals, but god I wanted better, and this is simply the worst remake Pokemon has put forth thus far, and my worst game of 2021. Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne HD Remaster featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series. I'm just gonna call it SMT3. When SMT3 was announced to be receiving a remaster, fans of the series went nuts, 
lauding this game as one of the best JRPGs, not just of the PS2 era, but of all time. Now, those are obviously some mighty big shoes to fill, and after playing through about 60 hours of the game, I'm pleased to say that I actually really didn't like this game. Look, for a PS2 title, this was beyond impressive, and the atmosphere of this game, particularly during the first few hours, was easily the best I've seen in a game. Well, as someone who hates horror, at least. My heart was legitimately racing from suspense at points, and that's not something I've ever experienced from a turn-based RPG. But I just didn't care for this game, man. Long story short, SMT is a series that bears a lot of similarities to Pokemon, being a monster-collecting RPG, except SMT dials the difficulty and mature themes of its story to 11. And Yes, I know SMT came first, but Pokemon is more recognized, so just bear with me. So, this game basically revolves around the idea of Tokyo experiencing an apocalypse, with only a handful of human survivors. Each of these survivors formulates their own ideal of how the New World Order should work and pursue power to accomplish their goal. You as the Demi-Fiend are supposed to find one of these worldviews particularly compelling and aid that person in accomplishing their goal. But I just found none of the worldviews interesting or relatable and... Of the two characters I actually liked, one of them dies. Which was an effective scene, but then removed one of the only parts of the story I liked. The only other part of the story I found really engaging, honestly, was a plotline involving an enslaved species known as mannequins. And yet, none of the endings really revolve around them. Despite there being a mannequin character that could have easily been involved in an ending in a way that would have been really touching in the context of the story. But even with all of that, I shouldered this famously challenging game and pursued the true ending, which involves completing a bonus, incredibly long labyrinth instead of the main campaign. And while parts of the labyrinth were... <laughs> I enjoyed it overall and found this path more compelling than following any of the characters. But at one point, you get to a series of doors that enact a stat check of the player character. Basically, one of your stats, such as strength, has to be above a certain number in order to open the door. And while this was a bit annoying, it felt fair because you chose how your protagonist's stats grow. You literally choose what to focus on as opposed to Pokemon, where a casual playthrough has seemingly predetermined stat gains. I said seemingly, back off, I know what you are, and I hate you. But then the last few doors of the entire game happen. You see, these doors also require a stat check, but of the demons accompanying you. The demons whose stat growth you have no control over except for leveling up. Because when they do level up, a random stat increases completely out of your control. So if one of your demons is only a few points too low in a certain stat to open the door, as was the case for me, and you don't have any items that can raise individual stats, which you weren't really told to save for something like this, you're SOL. But oh, SMT games are famous for their fusing mechanic, where you can combine two demons into one stronger one. But none of my possible fusions would pass this stat check, so I was basically softlocked, with the only remaining options being to either continue with the main campaign that I didn't care for, or grind in the hopes that maybe the demon whose stats I needed to increase by 2 maybe increases, despite the odds of that specific stat increasing being slim with each level. And... This is just when I put the controller down. What SMT3 gets right, it got so right, dude, especially the difficulty. Other than insta-kill attacks, which I will always say are BS, the bosses felt like a trial that you had to earn the right to beat. Conquering Matador and Beezlebub will always be an amazing memory to me, not to mention the three sisters and the menorah wielders, basically optional bosses you must conquer if you wish to see the true ending. But to get through this game, you had to learn how to assemble the perfect team. You had to come prepared. You just couldn't half-ass your way through this game the way you could with, say, Pokemon. But there, is just, there are just certain points, like with random stat checks, where this game just feels like it's creating artificial difficulty to extend playtime. 
While for its time, I'm sure it's a 10 out of 10, for my experience in 2021, this game lands at a 6 out of 10. If that sounds outrageous, just keep in mind the fact that I was less than an hour away from finishing this game once I finished grinding, after investing 60 hours into this game, and yet, I just, I just couldn't make myself see it through. But now let's talk about another one of the games in this series that I played this year. Shin Megami Tensei V has been delightful. For starters, it fixes a lot of the issues I had while playing 3. The protagonist gains more than one stat point per level up, the story was more engaging and moves in a new direction, the difficulty remains harsh without feeling inflated, the world is just gorgeous even though my Switch can barely run it, and I have only played 10 hours. I'm sorry, I loved the time that I had with this game and fully intend on finishing at some point, but I stopped to play through Brilliant Diamond because I was planning on making a video on it, but then I just honestly didn't want to pick SMT5 back up. Look, I'm definitely going to finish this game and even give SMT4 Apocalypse a chance. It actually just went on sale digitally on the 3DS. I mean, normally I am a physical collector, but in this case... No, but I think SMT just might not be for me, and honestly, I'm cool with that. I still think this series is great and needs to exist, but SMT's spinoff, Persona, just scratches a certain itch for me. I like having a party of characters, each with their own unique arcs, as opposed to being a one-man band with static demons. I also adore the storytelling and world-building of the Persona series. It just feels like the Persona series is made up of games made specifically for me, you know? But really, I'm still talking about SMT5 to say that the intellectually challenged individual who said SMT is just Persona without the heart and is thus inferior clearly doesn't understand this series. SMT and Persona set out to accomplish different goals, and that's entirely okay. Other than reusing the demons and a similar battle style, SMT and Persona are almost completely different series, and while I strongly prefer one, that doesn't mean the other doesn't have value. I'm actually not going to score SMT5 since I really only scratched the surface, but I wanted to say that even my first impressions were a huge improvement over 3, and I'm excited to see what this series is going to do in the future. And, I mean, I'll probably tweet my thoughts on 5 when I finish it, so... There's my shameless plug of the day. Speaking of Persona, Persona 5 Strikers was a really fun yet simple hack and slash with quite a few fun combos to master. The beloved Phantom Thieves from Persona 5 and Persona 5 Royal make their return and embark on a new adventure. And what an adventure it was. The story was fun and engaging with an interesting but effective shift in focus thematically. While Persona 5 and Royal focus on the bonds between Ren, the protagonist, and the individuals that occupy Tokyo, Strikers focuses on the bonds between the Phantom Thieves as a group of friends. The newly introduced protagonists and Tritagonists were also an incredible addition, both being much more enjoyable than, well, Morgana. However, while this was a good, if not a great game, in my opinion, it was a very okay sequel. And by okay, I kinda mean a bad one. Persona 5 Strikers is technically a sequel to two games, Persona 5 releasing globally in 2017, and its inferior selling but even better received definitive edition Persona 5 Royal, which was globally released in 2019. And while the Royal Edition vastly improved on the gameplay, story, and content of an already great game, Atlas made the understandable decision to focus more on making this game a sequel to Persona 5. Because, basically, every Royal player knows every event of Persona 5's story, but Persona 5 players are not knowledgeable of much of Royal story. And yeah, it's already a little disappointing if this game doesn't follow up the definitive version of its predecessor, but that's honestly my least severe complaint. You see, Strikers released on three platforms. 
despite the fact that 5 and 5 Royal only released on one of those three, meaning Switch or PC exclusive players have not experienced Persona 5 in any way. So when I say this game is mostly a sequel to Persona 5, I actually mean that the events of Persona 5 are barely mentioned or even hinted at. This game is designed with people new to the Persona series in mind, despite being a sequel. So now you have this game attempting to appeal to new players with an entirely separate story and as kind of an afterthought to people who played the original Persona 5 release. And royal players, we get nada. And to really make clear why I have an issue with this, here are some of the pros and cons to their approach to this game as a sequel that still bug me months later. Pros. The main ensemble from Persona 5 is here and as charming and likable as ever, and the world of Persona 5 is my favorite in the series, so I'm just glad to be back. And while those are two big, big pros, those are literally the only ones, again in terms of this game as a sequel. <sighs> now for the cons. One. Persona 5 Royals exclusive Persona user isn't even mentioned in this game. Now, obviously including her in the story would have been confusing for Persona players who skipped Royal, but she's not even mentioned. They literally could have made a throwaway line about how she was busy training for the Olympics so she isn't available, but no. There is just no reference to the deutagonist of the definitive edition that was released only a year and a half before this. Two, uh, this is a big spoiler for Persona 5 and Royal that really there's no way around. I'm not gonna say the name of who I'm talking about, but if you're currently playing through 5 or Royal, you'll probably put this together despite me not using the name. Skip to the time on frame if that applies. But two, a character connected to the Phantom Thieves faces a traumatic and brutal death. One, that character isn't mentioned at all, despite the fact that these literal children would still be traumatized by witnessing their death, especially with the extra context provided during Royal. Two, the true ending of Royal hints that this character is actually alive, clearly teasing a sequel while stopping short of outright confirming their status. Yet they aren't directly mentioned in this game once. So why would you tease this fan favorite's return in a subsequent entry if you weren't going to revisit it? While I doubt it, maybe they do plan on doing a true sequel to Royal which would fix these complaints, but as of right now, Royal is a generally $60 game that yes, expands and improves on 5, but Strikers provides no payoff for going out of your way to play Royal over the now free Persona 5. And I'm not saying Royal isn't worth playing, far from it. It's actually my favorite game of all time. Hell, I literally played it within months of finishing Persona 5's 100 hour campaign for the first time. It just felt weird that there wasn't even a line that acted as payoff for experiencing the definitive edition. One that, mind you, went out of its way to introduce loose ends to an initially cut and dry story. And lastly, the thing that bothered me most. Persona 5 and Royal are largely about Ren, the protagonist's individual bonds with a large gallery of characters. This includes the option to become romantically involved with almost every female character. This went a large way in supporting the idea that your Ren is your Ren. Yet, according to Persona 5 Strikers, the canon ending to Persona 5 is that Ren remains single. You even have a date event that takes place during Strikers with your choice of one of the four main characters that are women. And this event treats this date as the first time Joker and this character have any romantic interaction. Yeah, I know I'm gonna sound silly, but y'all, four out of a total of 10 romantic options return in this game. All it would have taken is 20 or so unique lines from each of the four and a question at the start of the game asking who you romance, and it would have gone a long way towards making Ren still feel connected to you in the way that Five and Royal were clearly aiming for. And for the six absent characters, it would have taken one line from Morgana. Oh man, so and so is out of town, huh? 
I bet you're really gonna miss her this summer, huh? Such little work would have actually made this game feel like a follow-up to your unique story. I know I sound picky and, let's be real, my appearance probably makes this sound like a weird waifu thing, but it just really bugs me when games act like your choices mean a lot to the world you're residing in just to wipe the slate clean in subsequent entries. Especially when there are easy ways to do it. This game would have been a 9 out of 10 if it acted as a true sequel to Persona 5 or Royal, but for me it's a 7. What's good in Persona 5 Strikers is great, and I still loved the story and new characters, but as a sequel to my favorite game of all time, this was disappointing, there's no way around it. Honestly, I don't have much to say here. The story was fun and engaging, the characters were voiced really well, and the presentation came together nicely. The gameplay wasn't anything to blow your mind, as it's a pretty basic third person shooter where you play a Star Lord, except you can direct the other guardians to aid you in combat and with puzzles. While playing as all five guardians would have been fun, I definitely prefer them getting one character right rather than shoehorning in as many as possible. Though, I still wish we could use the rocket boots an unlimited amount, just like Star-Lord literally always can. Huge improvement over the Avengers, and a lot more consumer friendly, as it's a game with a clear beginning, middle, and end, as opposed to the Avengers being endless, while in reality it's just incredibly repetitive with the goal of encouraging you to buy skins. It's not as good as Insomniac Spider-Man franchise by a long shot, but it certainly lived up to the legacy of Marvel games. 7 out of 10. Alright, now we're getting to the really good stuff. New Pokemon Snap acts as a sequel to the 1999 title Pokemon Snap. This series plays as an on-rail shooter where you play as a budding Pokemon photographer taking photos of Pokemon in their natural environments. As time goes on, you also receive items that allow you to directly interact with your surroundings, giving you the chance to set up specific and iconic photo poses. And while the original Pokemon Snap was a short but tightly designed experience, new Pokemon Snap has an unbelievable amount of content dude oh my god not only are there more maps but each map has several different versions of how events play out as the native pokemon get to know you they start to come out of their shells and engage with their surroundings more so when you're revisiting the tutorial map that you expect to be boring it can be experienced in so many different freaking ways it basically adds different levels while reusing the same map. It's honestly a brilliant feature. And that's not even mentioning the fact that most maps can be visited at different times of the day, and the fact that there are a total of 11 unique maps, each with several unique levels found within. And there's the fact that despite already feeling complete, the game has received a free content update, adding three locations with both day and night cycles and 20 new Pokemon. Honestly, I almost found the amount of content in this game overwhelming at times, as there's just so many options for what to do at any given moment. And the visuals were gorgeous, easily the best Pokemon has looked in a non-sprite art style, and seeing Pokemon actually have you know, personality, when they interact with their natural habitats is incredible world building. This is without a doubt a worthy successor to the 1999 classic, and I hope to see this series continue in the future. When they have more new ideas, of course, I'm in no rush. 8 out of 10. Alright, I had a great time with Deathloop. First off, it nails suspense and tension. The first couple of hours, you're just wondering what the hell is going on as you run into clones of yourself and a mysterious woman out to get to you. And it turns out that you're in a time loop on an island with an assassin trying to kill you each day. And so you make it your mission to break the loop by enacting a sequence of specific events involving the rich and powerful people behind this loop each of whom have a powerful and unique ability that you're able to claim as your own. Oh, so no problem, it's a run and gun title then, right? Well, not quite, as you're incredibly weak at the start, so you're forced to take a more stealthy approach. And slowly but surely, you become stronger and stronger with each loop, at which point you can run and gun in most situations. 
I say most because there's one antagonist that literally activates a nuke if they see you coming, which is a frustrating but innovative way to force you to change up your style, and I definitely appreciated it. And while you figure out the game, you slowly piece together the story and learn more and more about the various inhabitants of this island. In fact, I was able to guess the twist involving Colt's role on the island due to one key trait of his. It was something that felt earned to figure out because the game didn't directly confirm my suspicions until much later. As for this game's production, it features great voice acting, a really interesting plot, and amazing chemistry between the game's two leads. And best of all, unlike the spiritual predecessor Dishonored, you are allowed to approach combat any way you want, with no consequence other than an optional trophy. You see, in the Dishonored series, killing enemies not absolutely required for the story will eventually result in a bad ending. Which was innovative, but it was really tedious to me as I felt like the game was forcing me to play a certain way. What this game did, basically taking the solid gameplay of Dishonored and repurposing it with an almost sandbox environment, was brilliant. My only real complaint was that the game didn't quite stick the landing, at least in my opinion. The revealed relationship between Colt and Juliana feels mostly superfluous, despite being the big twist of the game. There's also only one set way to break the loop. You have to enact a specific sequence of actions in a loop with no room for flexibility. In fact, the game overall is pretty linear despite being presented as more open. While yes, you do choose the order you receive information and formulate plans, it's pretty much just like shuffling a deck of cards. While every player's playthrough will be technically different, it's still constructed of the same exact events just in a different order. And this is going to seem like a nitpick, but certain areas of the island can't be explored at certain times with the vague reasoning that nothing interesting is happening at this time, even though like, only 16 maps needed to be designed and there could have been objectives placed there that weren't just for breaking the loop such as building your armory. I don't know, that just felt weird to me. And the antagonists you're pursuing just disappear at certain points of the day. Like, you're on an island. I understand giving us a set way to ensure an encounter, but how does Charlie disappear for lengths of time on an island? I don't know, it just felt like a weird corner to cut. Even if the game didn't go out of its way to tell you where he'd be at different points in the day, we should have been able to either discover it on our own or just stumble upon him. Also, the multiple endings are literally a 30 second or so scene that only resolves the story of the two main characters and doesn't show any of the long-term effects of our actions and decisions. Also, also, even though I played it many updates after its buggy release, there was a glitch that would randomly cause your game to soft lock when you open any pause menu, effectively forcing you to lose whatever progress you made during that loop. I also didn't come to care for any of the characters quite enough the way I would in games I would rate a 10 out of 10, so this to me was an 8 out of 10, which, you know, is obviously still really good. It's just, you know, not that interesting for me to only praise this game for hours on end. Mario Odyssey, believe it or not, was the first 3D Mario game I ever finished. And once I got more and more into collecting games, I decided to play through the rest of the 3D adventures in Mario's catalog. Though, three of them being bundled together and one of them being dirt cheap helped quite a bit of course, but Never mind that. And while I had low hopes for the two entries in the 3D series, not to be confused with 3D Mario games, I, I know it's confusing, 3D Land was surprisingly one of my favorite Mario titles. While 2D platformers aren't for me, I loved seeing the structure of the genre translated into a 3D space. Three of them being bundled together and one of them being dirt cheap helped quite a bit of course, but Never mind that. So, when it was announced that an improved version of 3D Land's sequel, 3D World, would be receiving a Switch release, I was very intrigued. And honestly, it was a great time all the way through. While I wish the themes were improved as well as some of the visuals, the level design was pure platforming fun. Not to mention, they went out of their way to improve upon the framework of the original 3D World release. For example, 
they increased each character's movement speed by quite a significant amount in response to previous criticisms. 3D World was honestly a really good time, especially the post-game challenge levels. But of course, I'm not even mentioning the incredible bonus that comes with this re-release, Bowser's Fury. Bowser's Fury is a completely original, albeit short game, around 7 hours in length. It takes the engine of Mario World and converts it into a completely open world sandbox adventure. As someone who vastly, vastly prefers 3D Mario games that utilize a sandbox structure, this was a great time. The challenges were fun, and having Bowser Jr. back me up was a great addition that I'd love to see in the future. And the Giga Bowser elements were fun and for me personally, they never really got old. In my opinion, this is the golden standard of how to do a re-release, and surprisingly, Nintendo just did a lot more with the idea of a re-release here than SMT3 or Pokemon. 9 out of 10, and easily my top re-release of this year. I love Ratchet & Clank. I've been kicking it with this dynamic duo ever since my PS2 days, and loved playing through their PS4 title. Rift Apart was an amazing PS5 exclusive and single-handedly justified my upgrade to the PS5. Well, alongside Astro's Playroom, of course. The level design was great, the characters, new and returning alike, were really endearing, and while the story was a bit predictable at times, it was far more engaging than the other games I've personally played in the series. The action set pieces were also incredible, though that should be a surprise to no one by now as that's always been one of the places that Insomniac Games really tends to shine. Honestly dude, this was a great title. My only real complaint is a matter of preference and that's the fact that the weapons just felt a little lacking for me. You see, Ratchet & Clank has a huge huge array of insane, over the top, and at times juvenile weapons. I thought the weapons variety found in the PS4 Ratchet & Clank title were perfect, but then Rift Apart wanted to use different weapons to form its own identity. The problem for me was that certain weapons were an alternative to what could be found in the PS4 title, and in some cases I just preferred the PS4 alternative. For example, Mr. Zircon was a bloodthirsty robot that could be deployed to help you in combat. Eventually, Zircon's robo-wife and son even joined the fray. This game instead has... a mushroom? That doesn't feel as efficient in combat or as entertaining, and definitely not as funny or memorable. There is also a weapon that immobilizes a range of enemies, forcing them to dance instead of fight, and yes, it applies to every enemy including the final boss. This game replaces that with a sprinkler that immobilizes... really only one enemy at a time by turning them into a bush. And these are still clever and original weapons, but it definitely shows the effect of having so many original ideas in a decades old series. There's going to be overlap and you're going to have preferences. But honestly, that's a really small nitpick in an awesome game. And aside from everything I said, this is the most visually impressive game that I think I've ever played. God, this game is gorgeous. It, it, it's honestly unbelievable. 10 out of 10, but it isn't quite my game of the year. For that, we have to talk about... It Takes Two. Oh my god. I adored this game. It Takes Two is based on a rather novel premise, being an exclusively co-op game. To be clear, there is no way to play this game without two players unless you're very, very talented with your feet. And my girlfriend and I played through the spiritual predecessor of this game, A Way Out, a prison break game with a similar concept. And to put it frankly, I didn't like A Way Out. The first act of the game was really promising and fun, but it became really incoherent towards the end, the pacing dragged for me, and the controls got really repetitive. But admittedly, the two main characters were pretty good, for the most part. But long story short, the only reason I finished it was at my girlfriend's request. So when I tell you I was blown away by It Takes Two, I was blown away. It Takes Two follows a pair of parents in the process of divorce. When breaking the news to their daughter doesn't go well, a spell is cast that turns the couple into a pair of dolls subjected to the whims of a magic love doctor. Yes, I'm serious, 
and it's amazing. Every level is themed after an area of their house elevated to pure fantastical joy. A simple tree level, for example, turns into an all-out war between squirrels and wasps. The game is a 3D platformer, which if you can't tell from my top 3 titles this year, I have a really big soft spot for. And if that wasn't promising enough, every level comes with a new power-up for each player that fundamentally changes how you interact with your environment. So for example, there's a tree sap minigun, nails that act like Thor's hammer, and an Ant-Man belt, and that's barely scratching the surface. And all of these, let's be real, gimmicks are designed so well and are surprisingly all fully realized. Not to mention, the game keeps moving to present its next idea while you're still wanting more of the current one, as opposed to waiting for you to get tired of the current mechanics. And of all of the levels, there was only one that my girlfriend and I disliked during our playthrough, and it ended up being the shortest level because even the developers recognized that there just wasn't a lot to do with the kaleidoscope theme. And that's not even mentioning the dozens of competitive minigames that this game features throughout its world, and I'm still leaving out the game's most ingenious design choice. The two protagonists, Cody and May, in addition to always having different power-ups, can never trade power-ups with one another. This translates to each player having to contribute close to 50% to each puzzle and action set piece, and it's amazing. I've been playing video games for two decades now and my girlfriend for just two years. And unlike most action co-op adventures, our gap in experience rarely if ever resulted in us having different levels of challenge. So when we had to solve a puzzle, we could only do so if we relied on one another to solve it. Especially since the game would often split us up and keep us busy to prevent one of us, admittedly me, from telling the other what to do or getting impatient. This is very different than the LEGO games, for example, where oftentimes one player can just rush through a linear sequence of mini puzzles, and it can be frustrating if your teammate doesn't figure it out quite as fast as you. And if we're facing 20 enemies, for example, my girlfriend and I are both engaged in the combat the entire time, even if I just end up defeating more enemies than her. And the story as a whole was incredibly endearing and well done, as it takes us through Cody and May's relationship and has us experience why they fell in love in the first place and why they decided to eventually get divorced. This is my favorite multiplayer experience of all time and easily my game of the year. I cannot wait to see what this team does next and I highly recommend this game to absolutely everyone. 10 out of 10, if, if it wasn't obvious enough. 2021 was a weird year for a lot of reasons, but I still got to play a lot of amazing games this year. And I didn't even get to talk about the amazing titles I got to experience that released prior to this year. Either way, with the world being where it is right now, I really appreciate all of the hard work developers put into releasing amazing titles in a year where... Honestly, it felt pretty hard to be inspired sometimes. Thank you guys for watching, and please tell me about your 2021 experiences with gaming in the comments down below. I'm not even just grandstanding for engagement, I actually respond to comments, and I really love talking about gaming, so, you know, give it a go. Now think about it, think about it. If I was grandstanding just for engagement, I probably wouldn't have made an extremely niche video at a time when views historically go down and thus shoot myself in the foot in two separate ways with a video that takes as much if not more work to put together than usual. Though in fairness, the last time I joked about a video not doing well with views, it ended up being my second most viewed of all time and my most viewed one that wasn't posted onto a separate site like Reddit, so... Imagine how much of a jackass I felt like when that video ended up doing well. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. It actually really helps me out a lot. I make comedic commentary videos, critiques, and video essays every Friday. And if you're not convinced yet, you can check out a recommendation above. All right, well, thanks again.